Hello, Village, and all our friends uh, in uh, Lagos, Nigeria, in the Republic of Benin, especially in Cotonou, and all those that are hearing us from Canada and uh, from the United Kingdom, we want to welcome you to our worship today. I want to deal with a passage that is really familiar to everybody at least to most of us, is found in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Proverbs uh, chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. I'm going to give you the Emmanuel's version translation. And uh, I'm sure that uh, the media team will put uh, the correct NIV version on there so you can follow it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not in your own understanding and in all your ways and in everything that you do, depend upon him and he will direct your path. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, lean upon him, know that he is in charge and he will direct your path. Uh, this is the passage I want to deal with, but I don't want to deal with it in the way that we usually look at it. I want to ask a question. Do you know God? Do you know God? Do you know the Lord? Do you know him? And the reason why I'm asking this is because he said, trust him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. How can you trust somebody that you don't know? I am of the opinion, and this may not be original with me, that you cannot trust a person more than you know them. Your level of trust is going to be based on your knowledge of that person. Just imagine somebody walk up to me on the street and say, uh, Emmanuel, can you loan me $100? Now, I don't know this person. I don't even, you know, have any information about them. How can I loan them money? How can I even loan them $5? I can say, hey, here, have this $5 or have this $10. But immediately you say, loan me. You're expecting me to trust you that you're going to pay me back. And if you want me to trust you that you're going to pay me back, I have to have some level of knowledge about you to know, number one, that you have a job. Number two, that you're not flaky, that you're not one of those who will borrow and not pay back. So my knowledge of you is going to be very important. So if I'm going to trust the Lord, if I'm going to trust the Lord, if I'm going to trust God, then I need to know who God is. So in the next few weeks, I'm going to be teaching and preaching from this particular, who is God? Who is God? And do you know God? So today I'm going to do sort of like an introductory version and introduce us to it, and then we'll deal with it in the next few weeks on what it is to know God. So I... Uh, one of my former teachers when I went to Regent College in Vancouver, uh, Canada, was uh, Dr. J.I. Parker. I took the class from him that I will never forget, uh, Colossians. And uh, he was very well known at that time for writing a book titled Knowing God. That, that book was published by Interversity Press. Uh, I would recommend, highly recommend that you will read that book. Any Christian that wants to know God should be able to read that book. And the simple title is Knowing God. And uh, in there, uh, uh, Dr. Parker quoted a passage uh, of a sermon that was preached by uh, Charles Spurgeon. And that basically emphasizing the knowledge of God as very important to our relationship to him. So we need to 
there's nothing more important for a Christian than to really know God. The knowledge of God is going to guide everything that you do. I don't care what it is, whether it be worshiping him, whether it be praying to him, whether it be dealing with your fellow Christians, whatever it is has to do first and foremost with your knowledge of God. Even accepting salvation that is offered to us is going to be heavily dependent on our knowledge of God and knowing who God is and what he can do and what he has done. So who is this God that you should trust in? So who is God? And that is the question that is answered uh, for many years now by theologians in talking about the attributes of God. So God is the infinite and perfect spirit. God is the infinite and perfect spirit in whom all things have their source, their support, and their ending. Let me repeat again. This is, this is a very simple definition, but a definition that you can hold on to. Who is God? God is an infinite and perfect spirit in whom originates everything dealing with us. Everything, all things. The source of our being, the support of our being, our personality, our universe, and the ending of all. He is all. So uh, in the Bible, God is revealed to us as the Trinity. God is revealed to us as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three persons in one God. Three distinct persons in one God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we're going to uh, go deeper into it as we uh, do this. So I want, to look, I want to use two scriptures to form the basis for our discussion on God. One is Genesis 1.1 the first verse in the whole Bible. Genesis chapter one, verse one. And then I also want to look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse six. Let us look at those two passages together. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is a very significant statement about God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then if you look at Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So there is this uh, statement in Genesis that just, you know, the, the, the Hebrews did not go into the philosophical argument for the existence of God. They just said, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And uh, so we see this and we uh, look at it so far. Uh, for the next few weeks, we're going to go deeper and deeper into this. So we talk about it. Now, I want us to be clear on what we mean when I talk about the attributes of God. Usually, when I say I attributed that to him, you know, in other words, I gave this to him. I deducted from whatever I saw and I labeled it. That's what we usually mean by attributing something to something. But when we use that in the theological sense of the word, the attributes of God, 
we're not talking about what we gave to God. We're talking about what we have seen that God reveals of himself. And we do this by really studying the Bible and understanding what God reveals about himself, what God says about himself. So, uh, so this is the, uh, what we mean, what I'm going to be meaning when I talk about the attributes of God. What can we deduct from the Bible about God? What does God say about himself? What has God revealed about himself? Now, theologians for years have uh, divided it, it, this into uh, two areas. What they call one, the communicable uh, uh, attributes of God and incommunicable attributes of God. One is one attribute, communicable attributes of God are those in which we have sort of in relation to God, we have some of it in us. For example, God is holy. Man can be holy because God made us holy. So we have that holiness aspect that is possible in us. The incommunicable attributes of God are those attributes that God has that is unique to him. It is unique to him, and we cannot have it. For example, God is omnipresent. God is everywhere at the same time. Uh, even with the Zoom and everything we have, even with the jets uh, flying from here to Africa in hours, there's no way man can be everywhere at the same time. We, we don't have that at all, and we can talk about the others. But, so, but this is what we're talking about. I want to look at 10 attributes that I want, just want to introduce you to today, and then we'll deal with them in depth as we go. Uh, this is very important for us. Remember now, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? It is very important for us if we're going to trust God, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. You cannot trust in the Lord with all your heart if you don't know him. It's impossible. So it's very important for us to know him and the things we know about him will give us the confidence, will give us the knowledge, will give us something to base on, will give us the foundation of our relationship to him. So this is why I want to talk about 10 uh, attributes of God that is very important that for us uh, as Christians to pay attention to. Number one is that God is transcendent. God is transcendent. In other words, he is high and above everyone. Uh, if we look at Isaiah chapter 57, Isaiah 57, and uh, we look at verse 15. For this is what the high and lofty one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy, I live in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. So God is high and holy. And, and also, if you look at Isaiah 55, 7 through 9, I'm not going to read that. Uh, God says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. As, you know, as the heavens are high above the earth, so are my ways above your ways, and my thoughts above your thoughts. So God is transcending. So in other words, we'll say God is beyond. God is above. God is far away too. That can be true of, of talking about the transcendency of God. That's the one uh, area that we need to look at. And, and the second one that is also very important and is 
sort of like the opposite of the transcendency of God is the imminency of God. That God is not only far and high above all, but God is also very close and is involved with us. Isaiah 57, 15, the one that I just read, isn't it interesting that the same passage talks about how God is high and above, but at the same time, he is also close to us. Isaiah 57. Uh, let me read it again. For this is what the high and lofty one says, he who lives forever, whose name is holy. That's talking about his loftiness. That's talking about his highness. That's talking about how far he is from us, how different he is from us. But then it says, I live in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. So we talk about the, the transcendency of God, but we also talk about the, the imminency of God. God is imminent. He is close by. He is near us. He is high, but he is also low. So that's one. Uh, we talk about the transcendency of God. He is high. He is above. We talk about the imminency of God. We talk about God is low. He is near us, and he is involved with us. We also talk about God is immutable. God is immutable, that God is unchanging. That's who God is. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 12, and Malachi chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. Uh, in Malachi chapter 6, uh, in there I will not read the whole thing, but the point of that is God says, I am the Lord. I do not change. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 1. And verse 12, you will roll them up like a robe, like a garment, they will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. So we see here uh, what God reveals about himself in the words of the, of the apostle, in the works of the, of the writer. God does not change. Actually, this uh, is, is quoting from another passage from the Old Testament. So we talk about God being transcendent. We talk about God being, being close by us. The God is imminent, is close by us. And then God is immutable. God does not change. We change every time. The truth about us change. Everything about us change. You know, in a sense, when we say God is immutable, God does not change. What we're saying is God does not have yesterday. God does not have tomorrow. God is always present. Everything is present with him. He is the same forever and forever. Uh, number four, we talk about God is omnipotent. God is omnipotent. He, that is, he is all-powerful. There's no limit to his power. Uh, Jeremiah 32, verse 17, nothing is too hard for God to do. The passage in Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse uh, 17 is very clear. Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Nothing is too hard for you. God is omnipotent. He has all power. Doesn't it make a difference that you believe in a God who has all power? Or you believe in a God who has some power? If your God cannot do some things, if there's anything that is impossible for God to do, 
then you're not worshiping the God the Bible reveals. The God the Bible reveals is all powerful. There's absolutely nothing that God cannot do. He hung the moon, the stars, where they are. This is the God we, we worship. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He is all powerful. Not only did, did he create the earth, he sustains the earth today. Every breath that you breathe is because of the power and the grace and the mercy of God. So we serve a God who is all powerful. Uh, I don't know if this is uh, the part, but you know, uh, we used to sing a song, my God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. You know, we have to understand, sometimes we just sing songs, we don't pay attention to them. And then when something happens, we show that we really don't believe in the songs that we've been singing about because it doesn't show in our lives. It makes a difference to believe in an all-powerful God. That's the difference between the God I worship and the God that is worshipped by Buddhists, the God that is worshipped by Muslims. The God that I worship is an all-powerful God and there is absolutely nothing that he cannot do. Not only is God also omnipotent, God is also omniscient. Some, some people say omniscience. God knows everything. God is omniscient. It's all knowing. He knows it all. Some of us act like we know it all until we take a test. But God knows it all. There's absolutely nothing that is hidden from him. And it makes a difference what you believe. Psalm 147 and verse 5. Let me read that. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. His understanding has no limit. God is omniscient. There is no limit to his understanding. You know, uh, sometimes we sing the song, nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows but Jesus. God knows whatever it is. I don't care how hidden it is. You know, I don't care how high it is. I don't care how difficult it is. God knows all. Sometimes you think you're the only one that knows something. Forget it. If it is to be known, God knows it. So when you go to him in prayer, he already knows. He knows everything. There's, you know, sometimes we Christians act like we're telling God something he doesn't know. Sometimes in our prayers we do that. Lord, you know this. Lord, you know that. You know, sometimes it's kind of redundant. Why are you telling him what he already knows? God knows everything. He knows. He knows what people cannot see about you. He can see it. Not only is God omniscient, God is also omnipresent. God is everywhere at the same time. It is the same God. He's here with us while we're taping right now. He's here with us and he's at the same time in Lagos, Nigeria. It's at the same time in London, United Kingdom. It's at the same time in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. It's at the same time in Vancouver Island. It's at the same time in uh, uh, Guyana. He is everywhere at the same time. He knows you right now. He knows what you're doing because he is there with you. That's the God we serve. Omnipresent God, everywhere at the same time. Jeremiah 
23, verse 24. Can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord. Do not I feel heaven and earth, declares the Lord. In fact, sometimes uh, God is very funny. That's us funny questions. Uh, sometimes we call it rhetorical questions, but they are really funny. You know, God is everywhere at the same time. Where are you going to hide? From the Lord, uh, the psalmist said it, where shall I hide from your spirit? There's absolutely nowhere that I'm going to go that you're not there. Just remember that the next time you're going to a doctor to take a test, you're going to have your blood drawn, you're going there to take a test, driving test, and a DMV, just know it doesn't matter what it is. Next time you go for an interview somewhere, God is there with you. That's the practicality of the omnipresence of God. That he's there with you and he's there to uh, be with you and to exercise his power. Now, not only is God omnipresent, God is spirit. John chapter 4 verse 24 you know that passage very uh, familiar. God is spirit. God is a person without a body. God is spirit. God is present everywhere at the same time, but God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We must understand that God is a spirit. He's a person without a body. Not only that, number, number eight, God is holy. God is holy. And when we get to this particular one, we're going to talk more about it in the sense that this is one attribute of God that he prefers everyone to know him by. He is holy. He is, he, he is uh, without any stain, without any sin. He is eternally otherness, separated and unique. And, and in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2, uh, God was speaking to Moses and he said, Tell the Israelites, be ye holy, for I am holy. So this is a communicable attribute of God. God is holy and we also can be holy. Maybe not to the same level as God, but we can, we can. And we were talking about this at our Bible study on Wednesday on Zoom. Uh, we're talking about really how we Christians are responsible for living the Christian life, demonstrating that holiness attribute that God imputes to us and expects us to do now and then and in our lives. So anyway, we're going, we're going to talk more about that when we get to it. Number nine, God is not only holy, he is infinite and eternal. God is infinite and eternal. He is without limit and he is without a beginning and an ending. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27, and Romans chapter 1, verse 20, bear that out. Last but not the least, I want to talk about God being, God is personal. God is personal. God, he is a person. God is a person. Even when we're talking about the Trinity, we have to talk about the Trinity in the sense of one God in three distinct persons. God the Father is a person. God the Son is a person. God the Holy Spirit is a person. And, and we have to get away from this nonsensical doctrine perpetrated by the Jehovah Witnesses that the Holy Spirit is the mighty force of God. He is not. Because he is not it. It's not an it. It's not a force. It's not an inanimate object. Isaiah 55 verse 8 and Jeremiah 31 20 
is very clear about that. As we go deeper into this, now let me say this, we're going to come back, we're going to talk about this in detail, but I just want to say that when we talk about this, we want to understand this, that God has attributes that are revealed in the Bible, not what we attribute to him, but what he reveals about himself, and he wants us to know him by it. He is not just one. He is all together. He is all together. He is, the, he is at the same time omnipresent, omniscient, omni, om, uh, omnipotent. He is God. He is spirit. He is person. He is holy. He is infinite. And uh, he is eternal. He is personal. He is transcendent and he is imminent. God is. And when I think about all this, all I can say is, I don't know if you know uh, 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 this song, but we sing that song. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world that hands at me, I see the stars, I see, I hear the rolling th thunder that power through all the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God to thee, how great thou art. When we talk about how great thou art, we're thinking about the God who reveals himself, the God who is faithful, the God who does not change, he is immutable, the God who is omniscient, the God who is omnipresent, the God is omnipotent, the God who is personal, the God who is spirit, the God who is the creator of the world. This is who we're talking about. And the next few weeks, we're going to take this one by one and go through them to see what that means. If I'm going to trust God, if I'm going to believe in God, it is important for me to know the God that I believe in. Sometimes some people walk up to me and say, uh, you believe in God? I say, yeah, they say, I don't believe in God. I say, well, tell me the God you don't believe in. Maybe I don't believe in him either. Sometimes, some of us say we believe in God. But what God do we believe in? The God that I believe in is the God that I've been talking about for how long, I don't know. But God is real. God is mighty. God is good. God bless you.